I'm Mary Morrissey. I, uh, I'm known in the world as the premier trainer in dream building, not just dreaming, lots of us have dreams, but the art and science of transformation, dream building, how you actually change the results in your life. I didn't just drop in knowing this. I had an experience in my high school years where I had, uh, I was well known in my community. I was vice president of my high school. I was on the drill team. I had a lead in the junior play. I was a homecoming princess in my junior year. At the end of my junior year in high school, I got kicked out of high school because I got pregnant. End of my junior year, I got pregnant. My high school boyfriend had come home on spring break. I got pregnant uh, a couple of weeks and with a tasty 10 person wedding. And a couple of weeks later, the principal called me in and said, are these rumors I'm hearing about you true? And I said, well, if the rumors are I'm pregnant and married in that order, and then yes. And he said, you have great academics, terrific grades, but you will not be allowed to return here for your senior year. Be totally inappropriate for a pregnant girl to get mixed in with the normal girls. But we got if you want to get a high school diploma, we've got a place for people like you. It's a high school, not held during daylight. It's after dark. It's across the river, part of Portland. I had Oregon. I hadn't been allowed to drive in after dark. And it's where the pregnant girls and the delinquent boys go to high school. So over the summer, my best girlfriends that I had grown up with, their mothers got together and decided their daughters could no longer see me as if what I had was contagious. So I've been kicked out of my school. I lost my best friends. I drive across the river, park my car, and I'm walking up the steps to Washington High School, which becomes Washington Evening High School after dark. And I'm thinking every girl here is either pregnant or has a baby, and every guy is some kind of delinquent. This is my new student body. I don't know where you were at the beginning of your senior year or where you are right now in moments that might seem difficult for you, but know this, difficulty is not a stranger to the human experience. So that was where I was. I wanted to get a high school diploma because I wanted to be a teacher. I'd always dreamed of being a teacher. So my son was born in December of 1966. I graduated from Washington Evening High School in May of 1967 and in July of 67, I was in an intensive care ward of a hospital in Portland uh, diagnosed with fatal kidney disease. One kidney was totally destroyed with nephritis, the other 50% destroyed active nephritis. And <clears throat> it was a death sentence in 1967 without dialysis and transplants. And every physician and, and every specialist just, you could tell they really wanted to help me. I was young, I had a baby, but there was nothing they could do. And they simply said, if we could get the blood toxin level of my body reduced enough to sustain the surgery to remove the right kidney, then maybe I would have six months. Best shot. I'm 18 years old. I've got a little boy. I have dreams for my life. That's a dark, difficult time. So every one of us goes through dark, difficult times, which we'll talk about in some of the framework that I'm going to give you for having a mindset. It doesn't remove the dark, difficult time, but it becomes a navigation point for how you use the dark, difficult time to take you more forward in your life than you would have ever gone without that dark, difficult time. So finally, the surgery was scheduled to remove that right kidney. And the night before, a woman walked in my room asking me, uh, a volunteering, she says, I'm a volunteer chaplain, would you like somebody to pray with you? I, I come three times a week, get the list of those having surgery tomorrow, and the order of the most serious surgery first, you're at the top of my list, would you like someone to pray with you? I didn't really uh, have a relationship that I felt good about in terms of a higher power or anything you might call a higher power. In fact, the religion I was raised in, the church of my upbringing, I just felt like I was being punished. I mean, clearly I was a bad girl. I got kicked out of high school. My best friends couldn't see me. You know, I'm, I'm in school with delinquents. I'm a bad girl. And so deep down, I just believed that I didn't even deserve to live, that I must be, you know, I must, God must feel like I'm not even worthy of living and I'm going to die because of how bad I am. That was my belief. And so I did, she just simply pulled a chair next to my bed. She said, I said, oh, okay, and she pulled her chair next to my bed. She didn't do anything that looked like prayer. She talked to me. Now, this is long before there was a mind-body clinic at Harvard Medical Teaching Institute, um, a medical school. This is a long time before we, we had any understanding of the biology of belief or any of these things. She simply pulled her chair next to my bed and said, would you be willing to tell me what's been going on in your life the last year or two? And so I told her my story, at the end of which she just looked at me compassionately, and she said, Mary... Everything's created twice. I mean, it was like over my head. I had no idea what she was talking about. Yeah, everything's created twice. And then she said, you know this. In fact, everyone knows this. Almost no one knows the power of knowing this. 
And then she said, the bed you're laying on, the nightgown you're wearing, the sheet covering you, the walls, the ceiling, the floors, all the machinery you're hooked up to. First, it had to be a thought before it could be a thing. And then she said, you know that if you think embarrassing thoughts, your cheeks are going to get red. And you know that if you think strong enough, scary thoughts, your heart's going to beat faster. And then she said, I hear how much you love your little boy, but I also hear how much you've been hating yourself. You feel like you shamed your school, you shamed your family, you shamed yourself. And now that you're thinking how everything is created twice, could it be possible that all that self-loathing, all that toxic thinking, just with huge emotion around it for a year and a half now, could it be possible that that toxic thinking has something to do with the toxic energy, the toxic disease that's rampaging your body and, think, and threatening your very life? Nobody I knew thought this way. And then she moved on and she said, would you be willing to do an experiment? And I, no one had put anything in front of me. And she says, think about it. In the universe, every possibility exists. You can't think of a possibility that doesn't exist. Taking that possibility and turning it into not first a probability and then a predictability, there's, there's a science to this. But the first step is to know that there is a possibility that you could get well. There's got to be one because we can think it up. Everything's created twice. And it was interesting because this was happening. I'm 18 years old. I'm scared. But I could tell she believed what she was saying. And she said, would you be willing to do this experiment? Let's just imagine that everything that's toxic in your body that's causing this dis-ease, we're going to place it in that one kidney that's going to get removed. And then after it's removed, the first day or two, you're going to come back from surgery, you're going to have some pain, you're going to be noticing that more than anything else. But as the pain ebbs, your mind is like a rubber band. It wants to keep repeating the thoughts that it's been having, particularly the ones that have been well repeated and packed with emotion. And so she said, what I want you to do is this. Your mind is likely to want to go down those well-worn paths of previous thinking. So I want you to notice what you're thinking. And when you start to notice a loathing, self-loathing thought, interrupt it and say, no, I let all that go with the kidney. That went with the kidney. And then immediately, because you want to raise your little boy and you want to be a teacher. If you could live, that's what you told me you'd do. So you say, no, that left with the kidney to every self-loathing thought. Then immediately, just imagine, you had a little boy, a five-year-old little boy's hand in your hand. Feel that. Imagine that. Feel the warmth of his hand. You and he are walking up some steps into a school. There's a kindergarten teacher, and you're delivering your son into his first kindergarten class. And he turns and hugs you, and you send him into the class. He's happy. And then you hear the click, click, click of your heels around the corner, and there's your classroom, and you're a teacher. Then fast forward in your mind and you're in a big auditorium or a big stadium. All these caps and gowns down on the stage and at your high school, your son's high school graduation. And you, you hear his name called. He crosses the stage. He picks up the diploma, waves it up at you in the stands. And you and his family are cheering for him. And you're proud of him for all of what it took for him to be in this moment. And you're grateful for all the moments you had with him in bringing, helping him come to this moment. And your teaching career is growing. Then fast forward in your mind and you're sitting in the front row of a wedding and it's your son marrying the love of his life and you're the mother of the groom. How happy he is, how happy and grateful you are to be in this moment with him and your teaching career is flourishing. Just repeat that. She says, would you be willing to experiment with that? And I said, okay. That's what she said and she left and I, I did notice the next morning when they woke me early, early for the surgery that I had slept all night. I hadn't been able to sleep all night in weeks without, uh, no matter how much pain medication they gave me. And I just noticed that. Then they took me to the surgery, and the next couple of days, as she said, were pretty absorbed with just dealing with the, uh, the way they did surgery in 1967. And then over the next couple of weeks, uh, and the doctors told my family that was gathered when we first, uh, when they first came out, that one kidney was totally destroyed. The other one was partly withered. It was 50% destroyed with ne active nephritis. Time would tell. They didn't know how much time. You know, they hoped for six months, but time would tell. So after two weeks, my numbers had started to stabilize. And they had been stable now for three or four days. And then the, the uh, nephrologist came in and he says, you know, I don't know, maybe you're going to have a little more time than we thought. And, I mean, you could go home as long as you come to our urologist off, urology office tw uh, three times a week and get our, your numbers measured. Uh, 
between now and the time you have to come back to the hospital, you might prefer to be home with your, you know, good support and your family and your little boy. And I thanked him for that. I went home in an ambulance. I was so weak, I couldn't even lift my head off the pillow. And my numbers stabilized and stabilized, and then they subtly started to improve and improve and improve. And about somewhere between the fourth and fifth month after that surgery, I'm sitting in a conference room with the nephrologist, the um, urology head, the uh, GP, and other people, and they're just scratching their heads saying, we have no science for why you have one kidney. And the, the surgeon said, I saw it. It was withered, it act, active nephritis. You can see it. It's all nephritic. He says, we have no science for what's happening with you, but that one kidney is now functioning as a completely whole, perfect kidney. So we don't know how long this will last, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I didn't actually know what I was doing. Uh, I was just happy to be well, and that was so for the next two or three years until I was finishing up my undergraduate degree. I got myself right in school, got my undergraduate degree, and I took some classes that began to open up some things in me that this didn't happen to me. That, that recovery, that, that, that reversal in my health trajectory didn't happen to me, it happened with me. And there were some things that I could discover if I went deeper, what was the cause of that? How do you, how do you bring that? What is the pattern by which we can actually change the whole trajectory of our life? Even when all the specialists and all the predictors say one thing is gonna happen, what happens to those people? And how do we employ that and how do we work with that? And I got very interested in that. This is Mary Morrissey. I'm really, really privileged and grateful to be with you today.